Thank you. There's nothing better than that, to be taken up in the arms of Jesus and shielded by him. Welcome. We're so glad that you came this evening. I think you're in for a rich blessing. I'm very thankful that Pastor Pavel Goya has been willing to come uh, join us here. He's not sure what time zone he's on because he's always traveling here and there. And I, I don't know, there's a number of different ways that I can introduce him. But I'll tell you the way that is my favorite way to introduce him, and that is that he prays for my daughters. And that means more to me than the fact that he's the editor of Ministry Magazine at the General Conference or the, it, whatever. That doesn't matter. He prays for my daughters, and that means a whole lot to me. No, but we're very thankful that he's here. He has an amazing testimony, uh, not just from years back, but from recent history as well. So we're, we're very glad that you're here, and he's taken the time to be here out of his very busy schedule. So if you get a chance, just thank him for taking the time, and pray for his strength, too, because... Uh, he's not sure whether he's coming or going, I think. So we're, we're glad, that he's, glad that he's here this evening. Let's, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much that we can come here tonight and trust you as the almighty prayer-hearing God who is longing to move in our hearts and in our lives tonight. Father, thank you for bringing Pastor Pavel Goya here tonight to share with us. We ask that you would anoint his lips, uh, that you would fill him with your spirit, that you would give each of us just the message that you need for us to hear tonight, and that we'd be sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and that we'd walk out of here transformed and, and passionate about pursuing a deeper relationship with you. Thank you for your infinite, wonderful love for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> It's a privilege to be with you. I wish my wife was here with me. Then my joy would be bigger. <laughs> I don't know. You need to ask her. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate that you took the time to come Friday night. Usually people are tired Friday night. They want to stay home and rest. And for you to be here, it speaks about your desire to connect with Jesus and to learn more about prayer and to be closer to God. And that's how it all happens when we have a thirst for God that is greater than our physical needs or other needs. Unless you desire God, you'll never find him. And so, <clears throat> saying that, I want to make an introduction to the introduction. I may say things that you don't agree with. You don't have to agree with me. We just have to pray that God would impress you with what you need. And then disregard the things that you don't agree. If you get upset with me, I will pray for you. If you don't like it, don't call me back. But there is no use in preaching things that people like. There is no use in flattering people that they are okay and they are so wonderful. We are called in love to tell God's word. And most of the time, God's word is calling people to turn around. And unless we do that, we don't serve God. We serve self. We are not called to preach peace. We are called to preach repentance. And unless we challenge people, Unless you find the challenge in the church that to challenge you to the core, to turn around, you lose your time. You go there just to do your ritual or your duty. And if you think about it, all prophets, and I am not a prophet, and the pastor is not a prophet, and I'm, I don't know any prophet alive right now, but anyway, but all prophets, every time they preached God's word, they are not very much liked by the people. So our human tendency is when somebody tells us that we do something wrong, our tendency is to get upset because of our pride. Now, I don't know you, and that's really good. And you must be saints. You are the single holy church in the whole U.S. <laughs> okay. 
And so I cannot say anything wrong about you. What I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about me. And you just take whatever you like, okay? Saying that, let me, uh, that was introduction to the introduction. Now let's move to the introduction. Why do you go to church? Why do you keep praying and studying and doing Sabbath school and eating healthy and uh, uh, doing evangelism and doing this and that event and doing Bible study and doing camp meeting and singing in the choir? Do you think that all you do counts for something? No, nothing good enough. Yet, your answer is good. I cannot argue with you. Nevertheless, if we don't do it, we feel bad. And if we do it, we feel a little better. Do you know what I am talking about? If I did my three chapter study today, I feel good, I studied. And if I don't, my conscience bothers me. As my study would give me some merits. You follow me? No. Study doesn't give you any merits. No. Sure, you should study the Bible. You follow me? But it doesn't give you any merits. Whatever we do doesn't give us any merits. For instance, if I am poor and broke, and my neighbor is a millionaire, and he has whatever, and all I have are my gloves that I clean my stove with. I have some, I, I, I should have taken some pictures. If you see those gloves, you will laugh forever. It's going to make your week. Basically, I have some gloves that I bought them long ago. I found them in sale, two dollars for a pair of glo gloves and I keep them I have a wood stove to heat the whole house when I go and load wood in the wood burner those gloves get really dirty from the wood that sometimes is wet and from the dark ashes and, and burnt things in the wood stove when I clean the ashes out and those gloves already are broken but I keep them because I feel bad to get new gloves dirty in the wood burner you follow me? And they are broken and they are teared and they are dirty and they are so, I mean, they don't value a penny. Nobody would take them even for free. I mean, if I had to give somebody those gloves, they would be offended. What if I went to my neighbor and say, would you give me $10 million? I'm going to give you in exchange my gloves. Do you follow me? That's what we do with God. Would you give me forgiveness and salvation? I'm going to give you in exchange my good works. Do you understand the picture? Amen. There is nothing that we do that would value more than those gloves. And nevertheless, we feel the duty to do it in order to whatever. Sure, we should do it, but unless we focus on a close relationship with God, we will never be saved. Because salvation is not what you do, but is to know, this is eternal life, to know God. Amen. And this is what Israel didn't understand. The prophets, one after another, one after another one, before Israel was totally rejected, before Israel failed so bad, God sent to them prophet after prophet after prophet after, and at a certain point before they were taken to Babylon, there were not one prophet at a time. Many, Micah, Habakkuk, uh, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, but he was killed before. And so... A bunch of prophets warning them. And guess what? If you read what Jeremiah says to them, he says, do you think? And in Prophets and Kings, Ellen White explains that very well. Jeremiah says, do you think? Because you go to church. And Jeremiah says, because you do all the rituals and all the sacrifices. And you keep Sabbath. And because you eat clean. And because you are Abraham's children. Advent, Adventist. And because... You have the temple, the house of the Lord. Do you think that that saves you? All your rituals, all your church doing saves you? And Jeremiah says, you will perish if you don't turn around with all your heart and seek the Lord and try to know him and to love him. Do you get the point? And they didn't listen. What they did? Isaiah told them, God hates your prayers. He turns his head when you go in the church and when you pray. He doesn't like your assemblies. He doesn't want your sacrifices. He wants a humble heart. Amen. Do you understand? Amen. 
And they killed Isaiah. And they put Jeremiah in a pit, you know, in a, in a, in a hole. And wanted to kill him and then put him in prison. Because it's easier to keep Sabbath than to humble self. Oh, it's easy to humble others, but not to humble self. It's easier to return tight than to fully surrender. We have hard time to surrender. Moreover, to fully surrender, we want to be in control somehow. We love control. And we want to change everybody around, including spouse. Don't you ever do that if you want to be happy. When you try to change your spouse, you are the most unhappy person in the world. If you really want to be happy, change yourself. Stop changing others. Not even your children. Don't try to change your children. Try to love them and show Jesus in your life. When you show God and God's love and God's grace and God's wisdom, you save your children. Not when you tell them what to read and what to do and what to eat. Do you follow me? They still do whatever they want. They just avoid you and don't talk to you anymore. Show them God's love and show them God's mercy and show them God's uh, grace and show them God's forgiveness and show them God's understanding so they can see God's goodness in you and you got them. Do you understand? It's a lot easier to do church than to show humbleness and mercy and sacrifice and grace. Do you follow me? And you cannot show grace before you experience God's grace yourself. Before you go in God's presence and understand how you are. And understand how much God loves you. You are unable to share love because you don't know love. How can you give what you don't have? You need to have it. To experience it in order to share it. I'm going to give you a quick example. And I, this is not a sermon. I'm going to give you a quick example. I used to have a big head, not, not literally, you understand. I used to think that I am humble, but I am somebody. I, uh, in Romania, it was not easy to be in university. It is not that you paid the registration fee and you are in school. It was a tough exam. When I say tough, my sister, when she went to the conservatory in Bucharest, there were 2,000 students competing for two openings. They call them two seats. 2,000 students competing for two openings. So basically you must be among top two to be accepted in the university. Do you understand? It was tough. Students would take tutoring and pay big money to get in the medical school or whatever school for years and years and years. They will be poor, ruined by paying tutoring year after year. The best teachers in the country in order to get in a school. When I went to Construction University, there were 976 students competing for 10 openings. And I was the fourth among 976. And the fourth among the 10 that were admitted in the university. And so imagine how proud I felt when I looked over the paper, and I saw myself among the top ten, the fourth one. I was like, I got two hearts beating in the same time, you know, kind of. We say in Romania, turkey syndrome, you know. In different words, we say that he's proud like a turkey, you know. <laughs> you know turkeys when they get big and... Uh-huh, exactly. I felt like, whoa. I looked around to see if kind of I... I was there with my friend Pizzi, and I stood beside the paper so he could see it. <laughs> stupidity, human stupidity. In God's eyes, we are nothing. Without God's value in us, we have no value. But human stupidity, to feel proud for nothing, you know. So I felt like, hey, I was admitted. I'm a student in the university. You know, kind of. And then I finished. Top of my class, among top three in the whole university. And I had to fight teachers that were against me because I was an Adventist in a communist country. And they wanted to drop me from the school. And they literally looked for the best ways to make my life miserable. And I challenged them, and I called the commission from the Department of Education, from the uh, Minister of Education. And they sent a commission of three teachers 
from the government. And those three teachers tested me literally to the bone. I mean, they asked me things that were not even in the books. And uh, I passed straight. In Romania, it was grades from 1 to 10. With 10, that would be a straight A, like 4.0, you know? And they were all impressed, and I was impressed with myself, you know, kind of. And then I designed the Dimbovica River that goes through Bucharest. It is my project. When I finished school, I designed it, you know? And so I was kind of a big head. And then I went to law school, and I graduated from law school. And then I started a business, and then two, and then three, and then I had six businesses. And the last one, I was friends with the prime minister of the country, the chief of police, the mayor of the city. We were buddies. We were eating together. And uh, I would make, like, people would make 1,600 to 2,000 a month. A car, a new car was 70,000. I was making 40, 50, 60,000 a day. When people would make 2,000 a month, I made a car sometimes. I had days when I came home, 70 or 100,000, a car a day. Would you imagine if you would earn the money, the value of a new car every day? Can you imagine how much would be a month, how much would be a year? I had so much money that I could swim in money. And I felt so proud because I was sending money privately to build churches and sending money to the conference somewhere in the west of the country because the conference was broke and supporting 16 pastor salaries and sending money to, for Bibles and driving Bibles into the country, tens of thousands of Bibles, uh, hiding them under my car. And I was so proud. I do so much good. And I run the youth for the church and I organize the mission trips. And I... Uh, take care of the prison ministry in the whole area in the west and I do the youth and I do the choirs and I teach in the missionary school in Reshitsa and I do this and that. I was, I'm so involved in the church. You understand? I had a big head. And God called me to ministry. And when God called me to ministry, I imagined that God is going to give me the, the, the conference, considering that I am so rich and considering that I am so educated, would give me the biggest church in Timisoara. They sent me to the smallest possible church in the mountains where people didn't even know how to speak Romanian. Romanians would not speak good Romanian. And they would take one shower a year, sometime in July when it was hot. And they would sting so bad that when, when they gave me a hug, I was like, I need a mask, you know, kind of. And basically, I was like, what am I doing here? I mean, you guys, do you know, you, you call me and I am somebody, you know? And I had uh, Giorgio Armani shoes and I had Rav Lauren uh, handkerchief and I had polo uh, tie and I had, uh, you understand what I mean? I used only expensive cologne and expensive clothing and shoes. I would do my shopping in some time in Germany. I would... My wife and I would travel like 20 times a year uh, in different countries in Europe in a time when people didn't even have a passport. And we had money. You understand? When people didn't have a color TV, we had as many TVs as you want. I would give them as a gift to the neighbors. And so they give me the worst church in the whole conference, the top mountain church where people are totally uneducated in the church that they advised me not to take my car and I didn't listen and I took my car and I got my car suspended on a rock with the wheels in the air and I was unable, I had three people push the car down so we, we could and we destroyed the, the belly of the car and I said I'm never going to take my expensive car here you know and then I took the train and the train would not even go there you would get up the train and get in an old train and then take that train that was made out of literally wood, like in old movies, western mu movies, you know, and had an engine that had a big engine with, with steam, and they would throw charcoal and coal in it, and it had smoke, like, you know, smoke, and I was like, wow, this is cool, like in movies, you know, and then they got me off that train too, and they put me in a little train that had wheel with teeth between the two wheels to go up the mountain. I don't know if you know what I am talking about. 
It was crazy. I said, what am I doing here? And then I got off the train, and it was raining for three days and three nights, and it was mud, and in that village, they didn't even have black top. And when I put my shoes down in the mud, my wife, I said, I, I go back in the train. And my wife says, get off the train. <laughs> I said, no, I go back in the train. And I says, get off the train. It's muddy. And she says, what do you want? You want to fly? <laughs> I, I, so I put my other shoe down. And when I took this shoe to move, the shoe stayed and the mud came in. And I forgot that I am a pastor and I said a few bad words. I kind of, I lost it, you know. And my wife looks around and says, now you need to calm down. You are a pastor. <laughs> Human stupidity, human pride. We think we are somebody. Why do you feel offended when you are offended? It's pride. If you had no pride, there would be nothing to offend. Do you follow me? Why do you get upset? Human pride. We think we are somebody because if you are nobody, you cannot offend nobody. We think you are, we are very much alive because if we are dead, you cannot offend the dead. Dead people don't get offended, period, because they are dead. And Paul says, I die daily to myself. Right. It's a lot easier to keep Sabbath and eat uh, broccoli and go to church and teach Sabbath school than to die to self. And people would offend you and you would say, you know, I'm going to pray for them because they don't know what they do. And Jesus loves them to the point that he died for them. And you don't allow yourself to be offended because you love them more than you love self. Amen. Do you understand what I am trying to say? Amen. If that was the church, our church would be so attractive. Because that's very unusual in our crooked society. Very unusual. Our society is so self-centered. You follow me? Somebody that is totally selfless would be either crazy or extremely Christ-centered. Do you follow me? Yeah. And so I get to that district and I am hating the district instead of loving the district. And I go to the church and the big guy with a coat that I learned that he had only one coat that was for farm, for horses, for cows, for work, for corn, and for church. And he came with that coat that you didn't even know the color of the coat because it was so dirty that there was like shiny and no original color. It was the color of dirt. Like he never washed it in 40, 50, 60, 70 years. He was around 70 years. And he comes to me and he hugs me and I wondered, did he ever in a lifetime took a shower, does he even know what it means to wash yourself? And when he kissed me and he opened his mouth, the smell that came was worse than a dead body, you know? It was like, oh, Lord, what am I doing here? And then the guy says, Pastor, we are so happy you are here. But in a dialect in the mountains in Banat, a part of Romania, that I didn't know what he said. And I looked at my wife and she says, she didn't understand either. So as somebody a little more educated from the church, more educated, he had seven grade school, you know, not even high school. I said, oh, he asked you how you are doing and he is happy that you are here. When they talk to you Romanian and you don't understand the Romanian, you are in the wrong place. You understand? And I said, what am I doing here? Why would God do that to me? As I was somebody. You understand? But that's where God started to teach me that unless you love those people, you should not be a Christian. You should get out of the church because you, mis you misrepresent Jesus. You bear his name, Christian, but you have nothing to do with his character. Unless you learn to love people, you can never say that you love Jesus. It's just a pretense, fake. You understand what I'm saying? And there I started to learn to love those people and to go in the farm. Me, a lawyer, a construction engineer, famous, big businessman, lots of money, bunch of connections, big friends in the government. I learned there to go in the farm and work with them and love them and listen to them and visit them and care for those people. 
That was a tough lesson. What am I trying exactly? What am I trying to say? Why God doesn't use you or you or me? God can never use us before we learn to be nobody. Before we are broke and we humble ourselves and we learn to love people and we learn to entirely depend on God and zero depend on human wisdom or planning, God cannot use us. We will never have any success. We will only have a form of religion without any power, without any victory, without any transformation, without any joy, without any salvation, without any peace. We will never influence anybody else because we are not born again yet. You understand? Before we die to self. And being in that district, I learned to love people and to pray and to care. And finally, God gave, us, God gave me a kind of a business mind. I have a smell for money. I smell money. You know what that means? If I was not in ministry, I would make money. More than you imagine. Basically, I can tell you right away. I look around and I say, in this area, this is what you do and you make money. People would call me and I would tell, don't do this. You'll be broke in a month. They would not listen. They would be broke in a month. I smell money. I started when I was 12, my first business. And I made in a day, they made 2,000 a month, and I would make about 10,000 a weekend. I started businesses when I was 12. And then 16, a second business, and then 18, another business, a 21, another business. By the time I was 30, I was making millions. And so, when we moved to America, for instance, right away I told my wife, this is what you do, to stay home and to make money. I'm not going to go in those details. So, going back, in that time, when I was in ministry, when they called me in ministry, I had to give up my business, a load of money, and to move from making uh, 40, 50,000 a day to making $60 a month. Do you understand the picture? It's easy to listen to the story, but if you were me, I'm not sure you'd be so happy to do that transformation, to move from 40000 a day to $64 a month. When they told me the pastor's salary is $64 a month, I said, ha! <laughs> I said, I, I, when I would go to the Black Sea, people would take four, five, six hundred to spend, and I would take twenty-five to 50000 with me, pocket money in a vacation. You understand? And so, when they told me the pastor's salary, I made fun of them. And then the conference was in trouble and had no money to pay salaries. And I told them, still I had, I, though I have $60 a month, I can pay the salaries for all the pastors. I can help you. And they said, how? It was during the war in Yugoslavia, if you remember. I said, how many days I have off a week? They said, one day. Okay. One day, I welded two tanks to my car, fill them with gas, cross the border. It was an embargo in Yugoslavia and they had no gas. I sold the gas with $4 a liter. In half an hour it was all sold. Crossed the border, filled the tanks, crossed the border, sold it, crossed the border like eight times and made about 200 a trip. So I made 1600 in a day. And the pastor's salary was $60 a month. So I made 1600 in a day. Four Mondays a month, I paid the salaries for all the pastors in the conference, and I had plenty. I said, okay, problem solved to the conference president. And so, ideas, you know, just, you know. And so, I knew that I am creative, and I have money, and I have power, and that I am somebody. And then God impressed us that we need to go to school, because people would ask me, what about this prophecy in Daniel? What about this interpretation? And I caught myself unable to help my church members. How do you get saved? How do you get victory? And I said, I don't know. I never got it myself. How could I teach you? <laughs> and they said, we never heard a pastor saying that. Well, why, why would I lie to you? I prefer to be honest. I have no clue. But pastors know. No, that's Bologna. They just pretend they know. <laughs> and they say, whoa. <laughs> so I, I was ashamed that I don't know how to help my church members. So I said, I go to school. I went to the seminary in Romania, but you're not allowed to have a fully accredited seminary. And so I learned almost nothing. 
And I finished school and I still knew nothing. And so I prayed for a school, and that's where the story starts. And my wife and I prayed for a school. I want to make a parenthesis. I want you to hear. When you pray, you will get an answer, but not in the time you want, and not the answer you want. And that's the reason we get disappointed with God. Because He answers prayer, but in His way, not in the way you imagine. Therefore, we don't even recognize the answer as coming from God. And we fight God and say, why don't you answer where He already answered? Do you follow me? I want God to give me this, and God gives me that. And I don't see it as a blessing, I see it as trouble. But that's not trouble, that's a blessing. I don't know if you understand. And we don't appreciate God's blessings because we don't understand them. Because we don't see the big picture. And we are looking to this, and we have horse vision. I mean, we are very narrow-minded. And we don't see the big picture that God sees. And so, when God would answer a prayer, we don't even appreciate it, and we get discouraged. And so, I prayed for school. Keep in mind, in the Bible, 92% of prayers don't get answered instantly, but get answered in time. And only 8% get answered instantly. Conclusion, answer to prayer, it's a process, it's not an event. Therefore, you need to keep praying because it takes time for God to work with you and work with others. You need to keep praying so God could keep working. Did you hear what I said? Yes. For instance, how long did it take for Abraham to get a child? 25 years. How long did it take Moses to be useful for God? 80 years. 40 in Egypt, 40 in the wilderness. 80. That's a long time to wait for a promise to be fulfilled. Isn't it? How long did it take Joseph to be the dreams to be fulfilled? 17 years. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? Do you follow the pattern? Answer to prayer. It's a process. Sometimes a long process. Therefore, if you don't have the patience to wait upon the Lord, you have no joy and victory. Those who wait upon the Lord renew their strength. And the word wait, it's a very hard word for us. Do you understand? And so back to the story. I prayed for a school. And I prayed and nothing happened. And then my wife and I decided to fast, as we often do, as a hunger strike, to convince the Lord to listen to our voice. <laughs> do you follow me? We fast so the Lord would answer to my prayer. Fasting should not be that God hears your voice. Fasting should be that you clear your mind that you hear God's voice. Not to convince, to twist God's arm to do your will, but to twist your arm to do his will. Do you follow me? Yes. And we fasted to convince the Lord that we would go to a good school. Nothing happened. And then we applied to all good schools in Europe. Cologne, Newbold, Marie and Hue, uh, Bogenhofen, you follow me? All the good Adventist schools in Europe. We sent letters and we said, for sure they want me because I have so many degrees. Like the thermometer, you know. Guess what? Nobody even bothered to send me a letter back. I hated our schools. I sent a second letter to Bogenhofen. Zero. And they ignored me. Oh, he's from a communist country. He's dangerous. A vampire. I hated them. And then I said, sure, they will call me to school. So I had an expensive, nice car. In that time, it was a big deal car. And so, all the cars you will see on the street, it was a Romanian car called Dacia. And I had a Nissan Datsun in that time that was pff, top of the top of the top. And so, but allowing an uh, expensive sound system inside and this and that. I was like, when I would get in the car, everybody would look, they, they would come around my car and I felt so good about it, you know. And, anyway. <laughs> and so I took my car and put it for sale and I expected people to crowd to buy my car. And nobody called. And I went to the car market, Arad was the city. I went to Arad, it was a market where people brought cars to be sold. And people 
came around my car. I said, wow, for sale, yes. How much do you want? I told them the price. Please start it. My car would always start in a fraction of, I would touch it and vroom, vroom, you know. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> again, nothing. Ah, <laughs> again. And people shook their heads and they left. After they left, I turned the key and vroom, 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 the car started. I called them, come back. They came back. <laughs> nothing. Again. Oh, I got so angry. I got off the car. I hit the wheel with my foot. I, I, I started to hit the car. I got so angry. And I was born with a very short temper. It, it took a lot of prayer and a lot of humility to, to give up that short-fused temper. You follow me? And my wife, calm down. People may know you. You are a pastor. Come. This car. I hate the car. Why doesn't God allow me to sell the car? I need money to go to school. I need to be educated to go to the seminary. I was so angry that God would not answer. I felt that God goes against me. My car would not start. People left again. The car started. I called them and they didn't come back. Oh, I hated it. I could not even sell my car to go to school. I went home. And I gave up school, and I gave up education, and I said, you know what? I don't care. As long as you want something, you usually don't get it. Only when you are willing to give it up, that's when God would give it to you. I don't know if you heard what I said. Yeah. Whatever you want to save, you lose. And whatever you are willing to lose, that's what you save. Whatever you keep it for you, you lose. Whatever you are willing to say, Lord, I surrender. Do whatever you want. I am ready to, I'm ready to give it up. Then is when God can give it to you. And so, I gave up school. Forgot school. I didn't sell my car anymore. I didn't send any letter to school. I said, you know what? I don't care. I said, Lord, if you want me to go to school, you'll solve it. Your problem. Bye. That's it. Six months later, when I didn't even think about school, somebody knocks in the door. He said, I came from Timisoara. That was 121 kilometers, roughly 70 more or less miles away. A big city, 1.5 million people city. He says, I came from Timisoara. Big city, far away. I want to buy your car. Are you kidding me? Why would you come to buy my car? My car is not for sale. Well, my wife was starting the fire in the fireplace with all newspapers. And she found in the old newspapers that she was starting the fire with, she found your car and she likes the color. Sometimes ladies look for the color. I look for the horsepower, you know, but anyway. And so she likes the color. She wants the car. I want to buy your car. I said, sorry, not for sale. Bye. Close the door. He left. After he left, half an hour, my telephone rings. And the guy says, hey, I'm Lauren from the U.S., I said, okay. I'm Lauren. Yeah. I'm your friend. I said, who? Lauren. I don't know you. Hey, we're in the choir in the church when you're a student in Grant. My name is Lawrence Rock, and I had an open heart surgery, and you're my best friend, and you taught me how to sing tenor. Don't you remember me? Oh, yes. How are you doing, man? I remembered him. He says, I am in the U.S. I want you to come to school. Where? In the U.S. Why? The seminary. How do you know that I want you to go to school? I don't know. Did you? I said, yes. Six months ago, I gave up. I want you to come to school. I will pay school for you. I will pay everything for you. Come. Go to the seminary. How do you know that I want? I don't know. God just put it in my heart. And my wife looks to me and says, that's the reason the man came at the door to buy the car. Because God says, you leave. When you wanted to leave, you didn't leave. Now you leave. I pray, Lord, if you want us to go, you need to send that guy back because I don't have his name, his telephone number, his address, his email. I don't know who he is. He lives in a 1.5 million people city. How could I find him? I finish praying, he knocks in the door. My wife sent me back, said, don't even come home before you get the car. He says, you want it 4,500? I'm going to give you 5,000, give me the car. I said, take it. I got 5,000 for the car. We went to the embassy. We used the car, the, the money from the car to pay the visas for the whole family and the plane tickets for the whole family. And we had $140 left over after we paid everything. There were, I don't know, over a thousand people ahead of us in the line and many behind us in the line. 
Five got visa that day. My family, four, and another one. Five people got visa. My wife told me, please don't get the visa. Please don't get the visa. She says, I don't want to go to America. We gave up business to be in ministry. Now we gave up, we are going to give up our house and our friends and ministry to go to America and we don't even know English, not one word. I mean, I knew yes and no and bye. You know? We don't even know English. And we go in a new country and start life all over again. And in that country, people shoot each other on the streets. Have you seen what is on the TV? People shoot each other in schools. People take drugs. I don't want to go there. So my wife said, I'm going to pray that you don't get a visa. Please. I said, no worries, honey. I can arrange that. We'll not get a visa. So I go to the window. And the consul says, what do you want? I said, duh. Why do people come here to get a visa? Then why do you ask me? I want a visa. He says, where do you want to go? I said, Honolulu, Paris, Johannesburg. He said, well, this is an American embassy. Then why do you ask me? America. He said, man, you have a short temper. I said, I love it. He says, you are rough. Oh, I love it even more. He says, you don't know to be polite to me. I have no agenda, no interest to be polite with you. He looks to me, he says, you don't get a visa today. I said, thank you. And I left. <laughs> he says, come back. You know, you paid $120 at the gate. That was the fee to enter the American embassy, regardless if you got a visa or not. It was two months salary fee, two months salary to enter the gate. You paid $120, two months salary to enter. And you say, thank you? Yes. Why? Because I don't want visa. Because I don't want to go to America. I don't want to go to a strange country. I have everything I need here. I have money. I have a nice house. Why would I go there? He says, then why did you come to the embassy? Well, I don't want to be Jonah. He says, what do you mean? Well, I don't want to run from God's plan, but I really hope you don't give me visa. <laughs> he says, you must be crazy. I said, well, we are in agreement. Everybody says that, so I'm not going to argue in that part. <laughs> and then he says, so why do you go to America? School. Why? To be a good pastor. And what if you lie? I said, don't give me visa, please. He says, can you prove it? No. Do you want to prove it? No. Can you promise that you come back? No. Are you going to come back? Why would I tell you? If I tell you, you give me visa. I don't want to tell you. <laughs> he says, but don't you want a visa? No. Then what are you doing here? I don't want to be Jonah. He looks to me. He shakes his head. He says, you want to go to school to be a good pastor? Yes. Or you want to go there to make money? Are you kidding me? You know how much money I made? I can dress you in money. And we had a book called Cartea de Munca. It was the book of work. And it was all your work history there. So he opened that and he looked and he saw my salaries. He says, you had so much money? Yes. And you gave it up to be a pastor? Yes. You are crazy. And he says, you know what? If you go there to be a good pastor, I'm going to give you visa, but without your family. I said, bye. I don't, I don't separate my family. I turned my back and I left. Come back! Why? You really go there to serve God? Yes. I'm going to give you a visa for the whole family. Please don't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got visa. We gave up business to be in ministry. We gave up ministry and our house to be in America to go to school. We got to school. Our friend came to the airport, picked me up, took us to Southern Adventist University, paid one month apartment rent and one month tuition and said next week after I get paid for building that hotel, after I get paid for building that hotel, I'm going to come and pay the whole year. He left and he had a cardiac arrest. His heart stopped. And he was dead for seven minutes. They brought him back to life with electric shocks. He lost his memory. He was in, in hospital months. He had no insurance. The hospital bill was 190,000 or something. He lost his house. He lost his truck. He lost his boat. He lost his memory. He didn't remember his name. He didn't remember his wife. He didn't remember me. He was unable to pay his hospital, moreover, to pay my tuition. And I said, Lord, why would you do that to me? I gave up my money, and now you brought me to this country when I didn't want this terrible country. And you brought me here to destroy me, to ruin my life. Because when God starts 
working in your life, things never get better. Did you hear what I said? When things get better, it's you working. When God works, things get worse. When God worked in Joseph's life, Joseph got in prison. When God was in Moses' life, Moses got in wilderness, running from Pharaoh. When God worked in Daniel's life, Daniel was taken a slave in Babylon. When God worked in the little girl's life, she was taken a slave in the Syrian captain's home. You remember? When God starts working, in the beginning, your life goes down. Hello? Because God cannot use you before he humbles you and he teaches you that you must, to be used, you must totally be humble and dependent on him. As long as you have your own wisdom, God will never use you. Unless you learn that dependence, you are good for nothing. You are just a formal Christian. And God has to break you in order to make you. Hello? And we hate that experience. Therefore, we prefer a religion of forms. With no victory, no power, not saving others around us, losing our families, losing ourselves, dead churches. Why? Because we hate that dying to self experience. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. And so God allowed us to go through that terrible trial where my friend lost everything and we are in a new country with $140. No clothing and the winter was coming. No food and I eat 10 times a day. I eat every four hours, literally. My wife eats once or twice a day and she says, even if I eat a little, I gain weight. I eat 10 times, I can eat 20 times and I will never gain a pound even if I fight hard to gain a pound. I know it's not fair. I don't care. <laughs> deal with it <laughs> that's my metabolism it's not my fault that's the way I was made and so when I am so hungry when you go several days without food for me it was the end of the world basically I was so dizzy that I was shaking unable to walk and I said Lord I had a big house I had an expensive car I was friend with prime minister I was friends with the, pre the mayor I was friends with the chief of police I had money I could Swim in money, and you came here in a country where I don't know English, where I don't have money, where I'm, I'm nobody. I was somebody, and now I am nobody. And before you are nobody, and you know nothing, and you deserve nothing, and you can do nothing, God can never use you, as long as you are somebody. For God to be somebody, you must be nobody. Do you follow me? And I got so stressed and so sick that I got a terrible allergy from head to toes. I had big, big red spots on my body, itching and burning. And I went to all the doctors and they gave me so much prednisone that I was like not functioning anymore. And they gave me so many injections and so many pills, nothing worked. And they said, we don't know what to do. And I was poor, broke, no food, no money, no furniture. We lived in a small apartment. In our living room, we had the kitchen and the bathroom and everything. And the bedroom was so small that between the bed and the wall, you would walk sideways. It was terrible. And we had no... We slept on the carpet, and I learned on the carpet, and we ate on the carpet like Turkish people, you know. We had no furniture. When the pastor came to visit, I told him, sit down. And I meant it, I mean down. <laughs> because we had no chairs. You, you follow me? And when you leave a big house and you move to that situation, it's very depressing. It's easy to listen to the story, but if you would go to that story and you lose everything, I don't know how happy you are. Do you follow me? And I said, Lord, why would you do that to me? You, you call me to come here to destroy me, to ruin my life? What about my children? I didn't have food for two small children. You follow me? And I prayed, and I prayed for food, and I prayed for money. Zero answer. Did you ever pray and you get no answer? And eventually I gave up. I said, you know, Lord, do whatever you want. I surrender. I just, I am at the end. I, I hit the bottom. There is, I have no more. I was the guy that I had a thousand solutions for any problem you would come with. I, I was so creative. I had too many ideas in my head. Way too many ideas. Basically, 
In school, I have so many ideas that when the teacher would talk, I would get bored. I knew the, the answer before they told the problem. The math teacher would tell the problem. When he was half through telling the problem, I would, this is the answer. He said, how do you know? Obvious. And I, I'm bored. I cannot even stay in the class because I can teach you. I mean, it was boring. And I would just invent how to make their life miserable to the teachers. Literally. I would shoot them with rice. I would put water on their seat. I would, basically, I found ways to just have fun, you know. In the church, I did so many stupid things. I would get outside the church and put a string like a wire so far from the ground between two trees. When people would walk in the evening from the church, they would stumble. And I felt so happy, you know, to see them stumbling. I was crazy. Anyway, and so I had ideas, you know. And so now, instantly, I'm in that situation that I have no idea how, how can I redeem myself. I don't know how to get food. I don't know how to learn English. And some Americans, when you don't know English, they scream at you, hoping that if they scream, you understand better English. Like, do you understand what? You don't need to raise your voice. I still don't know what you say. You follow me? They come closer into your mouth, and they speak very loud, hoping that if they speak loud, you would understand more English. It didn't make, it was humiliating. And, 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 and I had no car. They would drive to school. I would walk to the school. And I had no food, and I would go to the class, and they would in southern, have a southern accent, and they would speak that type of wow, 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 English, and I got nothing, and I started to cry, and I would go home, I say, what am I doing in this country? You follow me? And that was what was God doing to us, to teach us that we are nobody. To get out of our head, oh, I am educated, oh, I had business, oh, I had ideas, oh, I am smart. To teach us that we are nobody. You follow me? Do you want to go to that? Do you want to have a powerful story in life? In life? Well, you need to go to that experience. Do you want to go to that experience first? Do you understand now? Why people don't experience power? Because they just don't like to experience humility and pain. Do you follow me? And so, God can use anybody doesn't matter who you are, how young, how old, educated, non-educated, rich, poor. Doesn't matter how sinful or how holy you think you are. Doesn't matter. God can use anybody based on his power, not on yours. On his wisdom, not on yours. If God can use a donkey, then God can use you. Period. Do you follow me? The reason God doesn't use us and doesn't give us power and success is not because he doesn't want to. It's because we just don't like the experience that would prepare us to get there. Do you follow me? And God calls us to humility. God calls us to love dependence on him. A total dependence. That's the reason we are called to prayer and study. Because through prayer, we spend time with God and talk to him. And through the study of the word and spirit of prophecy, God talks to us according to our needs. And the more time we spend with him, without effort, without even realizing, we become more and more like him. And we start to understand God more and more and to trust him more and more when we go through these trials. Because if you look through the Bible, consistently God works the same way. Again and again, God doesn't change. Works the same. And then you start to understand why you go through whatever you go. Because there is a reason. Nothing happens by chance. All things, all, work together. It's God, God's school to teach you lessons that are necessary for character growth. You follow me? And we go to God and say, Lord, I have this problem. Please solve it. And God says, I allowed it because you need to learn patience. I allowed it because you need to learn humility. I allow, because you need to learn to trust in me, not in you. Why would I solve it? You better learn the lesson. Otherwise, you have to repeat the class again and again, repeat the suffering again and again. Learn the lesson so you can pass the class. Amen. You follow me? And so, we try to solve problems instead of trying to grow. God doesn't want us to focus on problems because those problems are not our real problem. Our real problem is that we don't know our God. And we try to solve those things that we think they are our problem. I don't have a job. That's my problem. That's not your problem. Your problem is that you don't know God and you don't trust God. God can solve job. It's nothing for him. He would say, have a job. And then you have a job. He says, let there be light. Poof. 
He says, be still. God can turn the mountains upside down, can, can dry the sea. He can solve your job problem, but he knows that that's not your real problem. Your real problem is that you don't know him and you don't trust him, and you have a theory of God, but not a real God. Therefore, he wants you to focus on your real problem and experience him, and he allows these things, so you must experience him. Because what is the benefit to get this and that and lose eternity? God wants his children back home. And for you to get home, we need to go through these things to learn some things. You follow me? And back to the story. I started to realize. Because I was praying for food, praying for food, praying for health. Nothing happened. And eventually I said, I surrender. If you want to kill me, kill me. I'm done. I have no more ideas. I have no more solutions. I have no more power. I am nobody. I was somebody. People respected me. Nobody talks to me because I don't even understand this language. I am nobody. I know nothing. I deserve nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. I am at the end. I hit the bottom. I'm done. You can kill me now. I give up. When I reached that point, I said, I surrender. I'm willing to die. If you want me to die, I die. If you want me to live, I live. I'm not going to pray anymore for me. I'm not going to pray for health. I'm not going to pray for food. I'm not going to pray for English. I'm not going to pray for a job. I'm just going to say, do whatever you want. I give you permission to, if, to kill me, kill me. When I finally stopped focusing on my problems and surrendered, as I was crying, broken, crying like never in my life before, I never cried before. Even when my father died, I loved my father, but not a tear. I was broken. I was just collapsing. I got in front of Southern Adventist University, in front of the religion department. It was a big trunk from a tree that had speakers and background music, nice Christian music, you know, old wonderful songs. And I got on that trunk. I put my hand like this. I put my head and I was crying, like sobbing. And I said, I surrender. In that moment, somebody came and hit me on the back. Young man, why are you crying? I turned my around, it was Dr. Blanco, Jack Blanco, for those who know him. He used to be the dean for the religion department in Southern Adventist University. When he said, young man, why are you crying? I got straight, cleaned my eyes. I said, I never cry. <laughs> he says, young man, you are proud. You were crying. Nope. Yes. I said, well, yeah, yes. <laughs> Even in that moment, I still had pride. I, don't, I didn't cry. You follow me? How people mask everything that they go through to pretend that they are what they are not. Do you follow me? Yeah. Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. How are you doing? Great. You're great. That's a bunch of lies. If you knew what they go through, you know that they, they are not great. We pretend. So, oh, I'm not crying. He says, yes, you are. You are just too proud to acknowledge where you are. By that time, I had already three months of America. I was broken. I had a bunch of letters from the school that I didn't pay tuition, and they would expel me from the school. I had a bunch of letters from the housing department that I didn't pay rent, and they would evict me from the apartment. I got two letters from the power company that they would cut my electricity. I got a letter from the cell phone that they would cut my cell phone. I had no food. You, do you get the picture? I was like, like, I've never been to that place in my life before or after. I was literally down. And when he says, why are you crying? For me to say, I'm not crying. I realized a second later, how stupid can I be to still pretend I am somebody when I actually, I got to the bottom. I'm nobody. So I said to him eventually, yeah, I was crying. He says, why? I said, well, long story. Tell me the story. Nah. Why? Because I never complain. I never tell people what I go through. People ask me, are you okay? Absolutely. I, I, I was used to give, never to receive. You follow me? So I said, I cannot tell you the story. He said, okay. I went to the church. And Pastor Ed Wright, who was the, the pastor for uh, Collegedale Church in Tennessee, in Chattano in Collegedale, he started a sermon with a Bible verse that has been coming again and again all my life. I know the plans I have for you. Because God has a plan for each one of you. Ellen White says that it's very sad that we pray that God would fulfill our plans and we never seek God's plan. 
Do you follow me? God has a plan for each one. Not all are called to be pastors, not all are called to be doctors, not called, but God wants you, wherever you are, to follow his plan and wants you to use the gifts he gave you to honor him, wherever you are. You must be a blessing for your co-workers. You, might be, you must be a blessing for your neighbors. You must represent Christ wherever you are. Otherwise, you are not a Christian. And so, I go to the church, and the pastor starts with Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. And then the pastor says, God called Moses to deliver Israel. And then God sent him in the wilderness and made him nothing. From the son of Pharaoh, that was supposed to be the next Pharaoh, he becomes nobody in the wilderness. By the way, I don't know if you know, but in that culture, a shepherd had no rights like a dog, not even to vote. They were not even considered for witness in the court. They, had, they were not human beings. A shepherd was the last possible profession that was absolutely not respected by anybody. <clears throat> so God then sent Moses to be a shepherd, the last position possible, the last job that anybody would want. <clears throat> and after 40 long years, when there was no more hope to be used, God called him. When Moses had money and power and influence, God didn't use him. When Moses was nobody and had no money, God said, now I can use you. And the pastor talked about that, how God has to break us before he can make us and before he can use us. And when God called Moses, Moses was so discouraged. He said, I have nothing, only this stick. And God said, hey, if I send you, I will provide for you. But Moses said, I don't know the language. And God said, who made the tongue? You follow me? And as the pastor was talking, my wife and I had already three months of America, already knew some words. And we looked to each other, he said, he's talking about, he's talking about us, we have nothing. We don't know the English. We, you know, and we know that we didn't want to come here. God brought us here. And I told the pastor at the end of the sermon, two words, thank you. That's it. Didn't tell him my story. I you know. went home. The pastor went to the school. I learned like two, three months after. He went to the school. He talked to Dr. Blanco, the dean of the religion department. There was a student that said thank you, and they are from Romania, and this is the size, and they have two children. Dr. Mleko said, oh, I know him. I started to dig into it, and I learned that his sponsor had a cardiac arrest, and his sponsor was unable to pay, and they have no food. The pastor talked to the dean, and the pastor came to visit us. He knocked in the door. I said, come in, sit down. <laughs> he sat on the floor. He said, tell me your story. I said, no story. He says, everybody has a story. I want to hear your story. I said, well, not interesting, not big. Tell me. I said, well, our sponsor had a cardiac arrest, and we know God called us here, but God ruined our life. We lost everything. And we never wanted to come to this country. And I told him, in fact, I hate this. At this moment, I hate this country, I told him. Now I love it, but in that time, I was so broken and no food that I was like, what am I doing here? You know? And he said, listen, Dr. Blanco, I want you to understand okay, uh, something. When, when, when the pastor started to say, I know the plans I have for you. When the pastor said, God called Moses and God wanted this, my wife and I started to cry in that moment. Because it was like God was talking to us. You understand? And so we realized in that moment, my wife and I went home and we talked and we said, listen, we humans focus too much on our problems instead of focusing on God. And we get depressed and lose faith because we forget what a God we have. And God cannot help us and we have to keep suffering because we don't learn to trust in him and we still look for human solutions. You follow me? And we said, you know what? Let's leave it to God. If God wants us to stay, we stay. If God wants us to live, we live. If God wants us to eat, we eat. If God wants us to die, we die. Why worry? We cannot change it. Let's exercise faith. 
So we said we are deciding to trust in God. We don't know how to do it, but we just want to do it. You follow me? And first time in life we said, from now on, we are not going to depend on our wisdom and business and education and power and influence and money and solutions and creativity. From now on, we are going to depend on God alone. And that's when the pastor knocked in the door. Yeah. And he says, Dr. Blanco decided to pay one year tuition on the condition that you get straight A's. When you get a B, he stops paying. And the church decided that they pay rent one year on the condition that you get straight A's. When you get a B, we stop paying. I prayed, and by God's grace, finished school, bachelor in one year, straight A's. Paid off. I'm not going to continue with the story, but I want to emphasize one thing that we don't get. We must focus on God more than anything else. Why do we stress? Why do we focus on problems? Why do we focus on job? I am not saying don't have a job. I am saying don't stress over the job. Do you understand what I am saying? I am not saying don't go to work. I am saying why do you need to lose sleep over some other things? Right. When you should lose sleep over relationship with Jesus. Right. Right. Because all we have comes from God. Yeah. <clears throat> and all we have is going to burn. Everything that we have counts for zero. One thing counts, and that's our relationship with Christ. Unless you have a strong, continual walk with God, you are not a Christian. And you must thirst for God more than anything else. You must say, Lord, I don't know how to want you, but I want you. Therefore, I am begging you, teach me how to know you. As Moses said, I want to know you. I want to see you. As David says, I want to see your face. I want to spend time with you. I want to spend all my life in the sanctuary to behold the beauty of the Lord. <clears throat> As all the people in the Bible wanted a relationship with God more than life, <clears throat> you must say, <clears throat> Lord, I want you more than job, more than health, more than life. I want you more than anything else. I do have problems, but please help me know you. And if I make, we must make the goal of our life to have a close walk with Jesus. And not only to sing, and he walks with me, but literally to walk with him. Look, people in the Bible, why they are so powerful? Not because they are educated, not because they are smart, but people in the Bible are so powerful because they lived a life of prayer and the life of dependence on God and the life of walking with God. That's religion. Religion is not when you go to church, though you should. Religion is not when you keep Sabbath, though you should. Religion is not when you do all the forms, the right things, and you know all the doctrines. Those are good. But religion is when you have a connection with your God. Because Pharisees did all the forms, perfect, but they had no relationship with God. And they would kill each other and kill Jesus, and they were lost. Religion is when you know your God to the point that whatever you go through, you know that he is in control. Amen. And you know that he sees and he knows and he will take care of it. And though you don't know how, but you make a mind decision without feeling, without proof, in spite of any challenge, you make a mind decision to trust in your loving God. Amen. That's religion. Religion is when you want him more than life. Religion is when you study the Bible, not to do your duty, but to learn more about him, to know him. Religion is when you pray, not to pray routine prayer, your duty, or to pray to solve a problem because you are in a crisis. But when you forget your problem, though it is a big problem, and you pray because you miss him. That's religion. Do you follow me? When you go to prayer, and you say, Lord, I have cancer, and I really wish you would heal me, but... I want you more than healing. In fact, if I live, I want you. And if I die, I'm happy because it's going to be a second to the resurrection day. And then I see you. So do whatever you want. I give you permission. But help me know you. 
You, you want him so much that your problem fades away compared to the desire to know him. What Paul says, and to know him, and his suffering, and his resurrection, and his... I don't care. I want to know his life, and I want to know his death. I want him. I want him. Period. Him. More than anything. I want him. Do you follow me? That's religion. When you have a love for Jesus, that is the passion and the reason for your life. I want you to imagine if all our members would live that type of religion, people would see Jesus in us. Our church would be so powerful, so attractive, that you'll need no evangelism. Not that evangelism is bad. Evangelism is wonderful. We should do it. But you, you would not need to try to teach or to convince anybody. They would beg you to teach them about your God. They would come to you and say, I want to have what you have. Please teach me. Please give me what you have. People don't come because we don't have it. People are not attracted by doctrines, regardless how good or true they are. People are attracted by God's presence. Amen. And if they come to church and they don't find God's power and presence and salvation and love, they leave regardless of our doctrines. Do you follow me? Am I saying that doctrines are bad? No. I am saying that it doesn't help to have the doctrines without having the God who gave you the doctrines. Therefore, God calls you. Don't wait for the pastor, the conference, the GC, the whatever. God calls you to desire a passionate relationship with him. All over the Bible, God wants to have a relationship with you. God is at the door. God is begging you for your happiness. Please get to know me. Because if you know me, all your problems are taken care of. If you know me, that's when you have power. That's when you have peace. That's when you are saved. That's when you can save others. Your family, your neighbors. You. Know me. That's eternal life, to know God. Eternal life, Christ in you. The hope of glory. Eternal life. He who calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Greek, it's a con con uh, present continued tense. It, can be it should be translated this way. He who keeps on calling. Not he who calls. But it's a present continue. It keeps happening continually. He who keeps on calling. Continually calling the presence of the Lord. He shall be saved. If you say, Lord, please come. Lord, please come. One hour later, Lord, I am in danger to forget about you. Please come into my heart. Don't let me go alone because without you I am nothing. With you I am everything. Please come. One hour later, Lord, I don't have time. Right now I am working. But I just want to remind you, don't let me forget about you. Please live in me. Please. You, you follow me? When you make the goal of your life to have a continual walk with Jesus, that's religion. Abraham walked with God to the point that he knew God and they talked as friends. Moses talked to God. Daniel, Joseph, Paul. People in the Bible who spent that time of life and had that type of goal. They got closer and closer and closer and closer to the point that God would talk to them. God says, my sheep know my voice. Religion is when you talk to him so much that you know his voice. Don't expect that you know his voice after one date. You need to date him quite a few years. Do you follow me? Start somewhere. Don't wait. I'm going to wait until God does a miracle, an explosion, and I can see him. If you see him, you'll be consumed. Hiroshima would happen in a second for you. Don't look for a big miracle to be changed. Start wherever you are and say, Lord, I want you, and I want to spend 15 minutes with you. And tomorrow... I want to spend 20 minutes. And next week, I'm going to spend half an hour. And you keep growing as children grow. And you start with milk and you get to strong food. And you start being a baby and you get to the statue of fullness of Christ. You follow me? And continually, daily, by seeking him, he's going to keep working in your heart. If, we, if I came here this weekend without my wife, that I travel so much, and I miss her and she misses me, and tired. If I came here, 
and you don't make a decision. You lose your time, you should go home, eat a pizza, watch a stupid movie, and forget church. If you come to church and you don't act, you just listen, but you don't do, why are you here? No offense if we are only listeners. How does it help you to listen in a lifetime to 3,000 sermons and never do anything? Why? Just to feel good. Oh, what a good sermon. That pastor, he gave a really good sermon. Well, if you don't act on it, the Holy Spirit is calling you and saying, today, if you hear my voice, do it. And God says, you cannot do it in your power. But I promise, if you call me, I promise I will change your heart. I'm going to give you a new heart. Now people expect, oh, I feel it. I got a new heart. You will not feel anything. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You don't see it. You don't know where it worked. But then you see the effects. You see the results. You follow me? You cannot put your finger, this is where God changed me. You will just look back and you say, he has been working all along. And I didn't even know. All you have to do is to call him daily. And then none of your business when he changes you and how he changes you. But he will change you because he promised and he will never fail. Amen. God doesn't lie. His word is 100% secure. You don't need to understand. How can you understand how God works? Are you kidding me? You need to have a big brain like God's brain. You don't need to feel, you don't need to deserve, you don't need to know. All you need to do, you need to do what he said. Call upon me, and I will show you great things. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. Call, call him. Yeah. Call him. Lord, I cannot do it. I don't deserve it, and I have no hope. But you asked me to call you, so I am calling you. Amen. And watch it. But you must start tonight. Don't look for big things. Don't look for a voice. Don't look for miracles. Don't look for, don't look for anything. Look for Jesus. Do you follow me? Yeah. Don't look for answers. Don't look for blessings. If they don't seem to come, because they may come in a, in a different way, you get discouraged. Oh, I've been praying and no change in my life. Don't look for anything. Look for Jesus. Don't look for Jesus for a week or for a month. People tell me, Pastor, I've been praying for a whole week and I didn't change. Are you kidding me? Do you go to medical school for a whole week and you become a doctor? I've been praying for a week. Prayer, it's a lifestyle. It's not an event. You follow me? Just keep praying. Stop worrying when are you going to change. Just keep praying and studying and seeking the Lord. And you'll change. You don't know when, but he will do it. Because he promised and he cannot fail. Oh, and you'll suffer and you'll think that you are alone. But five years later, you look back and you say, that's how he worked to change me. And now I know that he answered my prayer. I didn't know and I went through it. But now I look back and I know. You follow me? You'll think that God is not answering while he was, he is right working on you. And he says, oh, if you would just trust me. I gave my son for you. How could I let you die? You follow me? Therefore, because you don't understand how he works, you just need to stay connected and to learn to know him. Because if you know him, you trust in him when you don't understand. Yeah. And when you learn to trust in him, you know to wait upon the Lord. The patience of the saints, you know to wait. And when you wait, you experience great things. Because eventually you are going to learn some lessons and then you are going to have victory and power, and power after power, and victory after victory, and experience, and story after story. If you don't have a story, sometimes you don't have a God. Because people who have a God, they have a story. And the story is not 40 years old. The story is just one week old. You follow me? Yeah. Because they have a story every week. Yeah. What I am trying to say, I am trying to say that God calls you to a new level yeah. of experience, personal experience with him. Yeah. God is calling you to know him because when you know him, then God is going to work in your life, in your family, in your church. 
wherever you are. Around, wherever you go, God is going to bless everything around you. Folks, what I say now, it seems very arrogant. But I say it with honest humility, giving God the credit alone. Not even crossing my mind to take one inch of the credit. Every time I stay connected with God, wherever I go, God is blessing whatever I touch. Wherever I go, blessings follow all around. One day, if I am too tired to connect and to pray and to study, it's a mess all around me. Whatever I touch, I destroy. And I get frustrated with myself. And then I say, why after so many years I don't learn my lessons? That as long as I am connected, he can work. When I am disconnected, zero. You follow me? We need to learn that. Not for the sake of having victory, but for the sake of knowing Jesus. What Paul says, and I consider all things rubbish for the price of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I consider all other things. You know how many means all? I looked in Greek, I translated the word. You know how you translate all? All. That's how you translate it. I consider all, everything in your life, garbage for the price of knowing Jesus Christ, my Savior. The more you seek him, the more he's going to let you know him. And the more you know him, the more you are going to experience him and love him and grow. That's Christianity. Let's finish for tonight. It's 8.25. We started somewhere around 7.10. I'm tired after a long trip. I woke up at 3 a.m. My time, that was 12 midnight, your time. And so imagine I'm a zombie, but we don't believe in zombies, so I must not be a zombie. So, so let's finish. I'm going to ask you as we finish to take two minutes of private prayer. And say these words, Lord, I want it, but I cannot do it. I cannot even trust myself to do it. Because human nature is terrible. So I give you permission to do whatever it takes. Work in me. And help me to seek you and to experience you and to know you. But then, say, Lord, help me to daily call you and your presence. Because this is not a one time experience. This is a daily experience. We must daily. Paul says, I die daily. This is a daily experience. You must call his presence daily. One day you fail, you go down. You follow me? So then pray the same prayer that you pray now tomorrow again. Amen. And next day again. And as you keep doing that, he keeps working on you. So two minutes private prayer. And after that, Okay, I was looking for you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. After that, probably you will have a closing prayer. Okay. okay, let's do that. Take a couple of minutes.
Father, thank you that you want us more than we can fathom. That you want a relationship with us to the extent that you gave your only son. Lord God, we pray that we would be stirred by that love that you have for us and that we would come to love you because you first loved us. God, give us a hunger, a thirst for you that is unquenchable because you have an unquenchable thirst for us. God, thank you for the amazing God that you are. Thank you for the amazing stories that we've heard tonight. And God, thank you um, that you're willing uh, to do whatever it takes to bring us to a place of nothingness so that we know that you really are everything to us. Father, Bless my friends as they go out tonight. May this not just be a momentary thing, but Father, may we really hunger for you to be everything in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for coming out tonight. We'll be back at 9.30 tomorrow morning, and we'll be, Pavel will be sharing with us right here tomorrow at 9.30, and then again at 10.50 we'll be having church, and he'll be sharing, and then We'll have our lunch. You're welcome to join us for that. And then after that at 1.30, he'll be sharing one final time with us here. So thank you for coming out this evening. Have a wonderful, blessed rest tonight.